Hello, I'm Luis Serrano, and in this video, I want to tell you something very special. I want to tell you that you are much better at math than you think you are. Most people in the world think they're bad at math, but I strongly believe that this is not true. I believe that everyone can do math. The reason we think we're bad at math is because math is presented to us in a very abstract way, and it is true that not everybody can do abstraction. Let me show you an example. I will show you two problems, one hard and one easy. And let's start with the hard one, which goes like this. I have a deck of cards, and these cards have on one side a letter, and on the other side a number. This is a fact, and I promise you that the cards satisfy one special condition. If you look at the card on the letter side, and the letter happens to be a vowel, then I promise you that on the other side of the card, there is an odd number. But let's say that you're not sure if I'm telling you the truth about the rule. You're being skeptical, so you want to verify this for yourself. In the table, there are four cards, and we can only see the top of the card, not the bottom. And the cards show a letter A, a letter B, a 4, and a 5. Now here is the question. If you want to verify that the rule that says that if a card has a vowel on one side, then it must have an odd number on the other side, which cards do you absolutely need to flip? In other words, what cards do I have to flip to make sure the rule holds? I will count down from three and tell you the answer, but I invite you to pause the video and try to figure it out yourself. And the answer is, you need to flip the A to make sure the other side has an odd number and the four to make sure the other side has a consonant. Why? Well, let's check card by card. Let's start with the first card, the one with the letter A. Since the letter is a vowel, then the rule tells us that the number on the other side must be an odd number. If this card were to have an even number on the other side, we would be breaking a rule because a vowel implies an odd number. Therefore, our first rule is that A must have an odd number on the other side. Let's write it down and move on to the next card. The next card is a B, which is a consonant. Now, consonants don't imply anything in this rule. Therefore, this card may have an odd number on the other side. This part may sound confusing because in this problem we associate vowels with odd numbers, but remember, the association is only in one direction. If we look back at the rule in the top right corner, vowel implies odd number, but odd number doesn't necessarily imply vowel. Now B is also allowed to have an even number on the other side. Both are okay. Therefore, we have that B can have anything on the other side. We'll remember this rule and move on to the next one. The next card is a four. This is the hardest one. What would happen if the 4 had a vowel on the other side? Say an A, for example. Well, A is a vowel, and vowel implies odd number, so we are breaking the rule because the number is even, it's a 4. This is not good. However, if the 4 has a consonant on the other side, then we're breaking no rule, since consonants don't imply anything. Therefore, 4 must have a consonant in the other side. We'll remember this and move on. The last card has a five. If the five had a vowel on the other side, we are satisfying the rule that says the vowels have odd numbers on the other side, so we're okay. And if it had a consonant, then we're still okay because remember, nothing is implied with the consonants in the rule. Therefore, the five can have anything on the other side. Now we have our four rules. And we're done. We have concluded that in order to verify if I said the truth about the rule, you must flip the A, make sure the other side is an odd number, then you must flip the 4 and make sure that the other side is a consonant. That was not an easy problem, right? You may have thought initially that you had to flip the A and the 5, and that is okay. That's what I thought the first time I saw this problem too. Now let's move on to the second problem, the easy one. Let's say that we own a bar, and this bar has a very strict policy where no one who is under 21 years old can drink alcohol. Younger people are allowed at the bar, but they're not permitted to drink alcohol. We see four patrons at the bar, and we really want to make sure that there's no underage drinking. For each of the patrons, we have one piece of information. We may need to investigate more, or we may be content with the information we have. Let's see what we know. We know that the first person is 16 years old. The second one is 25 years old, and we don't know what either one of them are drinking. The third one, we don't know their age, but we know that she's drinking vodka, 
and the fourth person, we also don't know their age, but we know that they're drinking orange juice. Now the question is, which customers do I need to investigate to make sure no one under 21 years old is drinking alcohol? Now investigate could mean I could find out what they're drinking if I don't know, or I could find out their age if I don't know it. And remember that what we wanna do is to not allow anyone who is under 21 to drink an alcoholic beverage. And again, I will give you three seconds and I'll tell you the answer, but I invite you to pause the video and find the answer yourself. And the answer is, well, let's look at them one by one. The first one is 16, so we need to check their drink and make sure that they're not drinking alcohol. The second one is 25. She can drink whatever she wants. The third one is drinking vodka, so we should check her age to make sure she's not underage. And the fourth one is drinking juice, so it doesn't matter what age they have. That was much easier, right? Well, it turns out that these two problems are the exact same problem. They utilize the exact same logic. But why is the first one hard yet the second one easy? The reason is that the first one is in an abstract scenario and the second one is in a real scenario. We don't often bump into cars with numbers and letters and complicated rules, so we're not used to live in that world. On the other hand, we can use some common sense to figure out who in a bar is potentially breaking the law. Let me show you why the logic in these two problems is the exact same thing. If we have events A and B, it is a common misconception that A implies B is equivalent to B implies A. This is not true. For example, if it is Monday, then I go to work. But if I go to work, that doesn't necessarily imply that it is Monday. It could be any other day of the week. What is true is the contrapositive, which says that A implies B is equivalent to not B implies not A. In this way, this is equivalent to say that if I didn't work, then for sure it was on Monday, because I work on Mondays. In our case, we have that the events are A is that the letter is a vowel and B is that the number is odd. This is equivalent to saying that if the number is even, then the letter must be a consonant. And in the bar case, the events are the following. A is that the person is drinking alcohol, and that implies that B, the person is 21 or older. And this is equivalent to saying that not B, if the person is under 21, implies not A, that the person is not drinking alcohol. However, the correspondence in the left is not obvious. We have to check all four cases. On the other hand, the correspondence in the right is obvious since we won't accidentally card someone who's not drinking alcohol or we won't check the drink of someone who's over 21. We know better in that case. It's almost like that logic is already ingrained in our brain. Let me elaborate for clarity. The statement A implies B is equivalent to saying that A and not B never happens. In the card case, it means that we will never have a card that has a vowel on one side and an even number on the other side. In the bar case, it means we'll never have an underage person drinking alcohol. The card side is not obvious because those cards are rare. This is not something we see every day and we're not used to it. However, the bar case is common sense because it relates to the world in which we live in, so it is obvious. The conclusion that I see is that we are indeed very good at logic, but we are much better at applying it to real scenarios without even thinking that it is math. The moment we remove the reality, we have to deal with a purely theoretical scenario, and in those, we don't have much practice. We spend most of the day solving logical problems in order to get by. If we couldn't solve logical problems, we would constantly be breaking the law or making mistakes. However, we don't spend that much time dealing with abstraction, so it doesn't come out as naturally as reality. So next time you're going to say you're bad at math, don't say it, because it is not true. Instead say, I'm bad at abstraction, but I'm great at math. Because for that, most people are. I'll include myself among the ones that are bad at abstraction. And that's all for today. I hope you've enjoyed it. I'd like to remind you that I have a machine learning book called Grokking Machine Learning, in which I explain the concepts of machine learning in a down-to-earth way, with real examples for everybody to understand. In the description, you can find the link to the book and a very special 40% discount for the viewers of this channel. 
And as usual, if you enjoyed this video, please uh, subscribe to my channel for more content or hit like or share amongst your friends. And feel free to write a comment. I really enjoy reading your comments, especially those with suggestions for future topics. And if you'd like to tweet at me, my Twitter handle is LewisLikesMath. All the information, videos, writings, etc. can be found at this link, serrano.academy. So check it out. Thank you very much for your attention and see you in the next video.